second week where we enter into the kerygma, right? The, the proclamation of what God has done for us in Jesus. And this is the first prong of it. And we call that created. And you might have a subtitle there with created that says, your image of God is too small. Right? Which, when I uh, saw that, it, it reminded me of this, uh, uh, of a Marvel movie. So hopefully some of you know what that is and uh, have seen those, but the Avengers. And there's a scene where the Incredible Hulk and Loki are in the Stark Tower and Incredible Hulk's getting ready to pulverize Loki, right? And so Loki's trying to stop him and he says, hey, I am a god, right? I will not be bullied. And about that moment, the Hulk grabs him by the foot and slams him into the floor a few times and then leaves him there breathless. And as he's walking away, the Hulk goes, puny god. And that's what I thought of whenever I was thinking, our, our image of God is a puny God. We really want to dig in in created and know who God really is. And so I want you to pray during this homily, but also during this week for the grace of wonder and trust. All right? Wonder and trust. So for us to grasp who God is, we have to understand him from Revelation. And sometimes those first few chapters of Gen Genesis are confusing to people, right? So we don't quite understand how to understand them. We gotta remember that the Bible is a library of books under different genres. And so we gotta know what we're looking at. The best explanation for what those first 11 chapters of Genesis are is inspired poetry, right? It's inspired poetry. Now, poetry communicates truth to us in a poetic way, not necessarily a literal way. And so the authors are less concerned about how things came about, but they're, they're more concerned about expressing why they came about, right? Why God created the world. And, you know, many times you'll see in uh, maybe just articles or people talking, debates and things that uh, will pit science against the Bible, that we think often that truth is only cold hard facts, mathematical formulas, and things that can be proven by the scientific method. But that's a pretty uh, diminished understanding of truth because how do we, is that saying we can't prove intangible things like love? Is love unprovable? Of course not, right? Everyone knows love exists, uh, love is real. And so the initial chapters of Genesis are this inspired poetry. They communicate truth to us in a rich, diverse way. Uh, and the focus is, we, and we tend to focus on what the authors aren't saying instead of what they are trying to tell us, what they're revealing to us. Not the how, but why. Why does something exist? So imagine, uh, I'll give you an image of this uh, poetic way of, of coming to truth. So imagine that some, someone you love. Now imagine you accept yourself expressing your love to that person in only objective, mathematical, and scientific terms. It might sound like this. I am experiencing something in relation to you that is characterized by feelings of warmth, closeness, and affection. As a human being, I am programmed to live in community, and it's in my DNA to form attachments to other people. I sense such an attachment to you. Various hormones are involved as well, and I am actually, occasionally, act in a way that seems contrary to reason, perhaps even responding with giddiness. I believe that the term for this is love. Do you think that would win over the heart of the man or woman that you're speaking to? I doubt it, right? No, more likely, one you love, you're gonna walk hand in hand with your beloved, bursting with gratitude and wonder at the relationship and all the riches that it's brought to your life. And you'll find yourself saying, I love you, right? You mean everything to me. You have changed my life and I can't imagine the world without you. That's the difference between a scientific explanation and poetry, right? And as we enter deeply into scripture, we find that it's more like a love letter from God to the whole human person than a newspaper article or a science book, right? That's the beauty and genius of the word of God. 
So what is it that Genesis is trying to teach us about who God is, right? It's a radically different worldview than Israel's neighbors had at that time, right? The Near East, the ancient Near East, they saw the world in a certain way. There were many gods. None of them were really true or good. They were instead pretty much like us, just a little more extreme. So they were angry, greedy, lustful, spiteful. And at some certain moment, this was their story, at some certain moment, their, their gods created man to be their slaves. And as such, there really wasn't an ultimate point to life. Life was truly meaningless. I mean, with that worldview, what could be the goal except to minimize pain and maximize pleasure, right? In a world like that, despair was rampant. How could it not be? So we look back and we see these things as they were expressed around uh, those people who are around Israel, and it's very similar to what is expressed today in our world, right? They're this maximize pleasure and minimize pain because that's all you got, right? Well, into that world and this one, God's revelation again breaks in, and he reveals something very different. There is but one God, and he is very, very good. And everything he made, he made freely, without effort, and out of love. And the highlight of everything that he made, yep, that's me and you, right? He made everything, that human person. As he says, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, in the biblical vision of reality, the human person is not created to be a slave, but is created with extraordinary worth and dignity because we're created in God's image and likeness, the one and only true and loving God. So here are those highlights, right? We created in God's image and likeness. We have capacity for reason, for freedom. We're made for friendship and love with God and others. That's what Genesis communicates to us. Now, sometimes we misuse the word freedom, right? We think of it as we can do whatever we want when we want to, right? That's not freedom, that's lawlessness. Freedom, the true purpose of freedom is to be able to love and to be loved, right? A free person can choose to love. And only love can satisfy our hearts because you and I were created in the image and likeness of God who is love, right? Love is it. So not only have we been created for love, by love, but we're invited to partake and share in the divine nature of God himself, right? If we use our freedom well, that we will become like God. What an unbelievable gift. But let's take a moment to reflect on just the power of God and the immensity of his love for us. And this is most astounding. God is quite simply incomprehensible. Whatever picture you have of God, your puny God, it's wrong, it's small, it's further away from the truth than it is close to it, right? He's all powerful beyond any imagining. So here's a few instances that maybe help open this up, right? The universe, our universe that God created is roughly 46 billion light years across. So what that means, 46 billion multiplied by almost 6 trillion miles, right? That's, I don't even know what those numbers mean. They're so, they're so big. It's made up, our universe is made up of 100 billion galaxies, of which we're one, right? The Milky Way. 100 billion galaxies. And each one of those galaxies hold 100 billion stars. And God made all of that created that whole universe with one little sentence, let there be light, and boom, all of this exists. So there's an astrophysicist who tried to put the enormity of this universe of ours into perspective for us to help us grasp it. And he said, if you took all of the stars of our galaxy alone, just this one galaxy, over around 100 billion, and you made each of them a grain of sand and built a sandcastle, do you know how big the sandcastle would be? five miles high, five miles wide, 
and five miles long, right? Each one of those grains of sand is the equivalent of one star in our galaxy alone, the immensity of it. And as a matter of fact, there are 10 times as many stars in our galaxy as there are grains of sand on the earth. <laughs> this is our God. Now, this is one of my favorite things. One of the biggest stars that we were aware of until recently, there's a little bit bigger one, but for the illustration, was called Canis Majoris, right? Which in Latin is Latin for big dog, right? I'm thinking some college guy discovered this and named it, right? Uh, big dog. Uh, our Earth can fit into our sun, right? You can take our sun, fit it into this star, or our Earth, sorry, and fit it into our star, the sun, 980,000 times. And then you can take our Earth and fit it into Big Dog, eight, seven quadrillion times. So I don't know about you, but I don't even know what quadrillion means. I didn't know it was a, I didn't know it was a number, but here's a little way to help you understand how big that is. If I was going to begin to count to a million, I would see you in 11 and a half days. If I was going to try to count to a billion, it would take me 31 years. If I was gonna to count to a trillion, couldn't do it. 31,000 years. Now here it is. If you're gonna to count to a quadrillion, it will take 31 million years and seven quadrillion Earths can fit in the big dog. And that's just one of the biggest in our galaxy, right? And God made all of this stuff with almost an afterthought in Genesis 1.16. After the first part of the sentence, it says, oh yeah, by the way, also, he made all the stars, right? That one little word, what an amazing thing. Amidst this massive, immeasurable universe, the creature that God loves the most is the one that catches his eye. That's you and me, personally, by name. God doesn't see crowds. He sees each one of us personally. Grasping this kind of immensity of God, it helps us answer these other questions that we opened up last week. Why is there something rather than nothing? Which leads to why am I here? Where am I going and how do I get there? So the answer biblically to all three of these is the same, love. Why am I here? Because the creator of this massive universe who simply said, let there be light, chose to create me. He willed me and you into being. I don't just happen to be here. You don't just happen to be here. You're here because in God's mind, it's good that you exist. If you didn't exist, if, if the fact that you exist means that it's good, that you're good. Where am I going? Well, what's the end for which I was made? What's the purpose of my life? The meaning? Love. You and I were created to be divinized, to become like God who is love, to share forever in God's own abundant life, joy, and happiness. Right? How do we get there? We get there by his love, which he poured out for us on the cross. In other words, we get there by loving God, letting God love us and also by loving God and others in return, just as Jesus teaches us in the Gospels. So as we reflect on the first part of the kerygma, created, let us realize with wonder and awe that God, who is infinitely good, truly good and loving and powerful, beyond all telling, willed me and you into existence. And is holding us in existence at this very moment. And he's holding me and you and everyone that you love with care firmly in his hands. He says to us right now, you are my son. You are my daughter. Your life is firmly in my hands. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. I have a plan for your life. I have created you to be infinitely happy. And it is my good pleasure that you would know me and, and my love and all I have done for you, and give joyful witness to this extraordinary news. This week, reflect on creation in wonder and awe. The God you speak to in prayer is the same God who made all that is, this immense universe. He can handle what's going on in your life. Scripture says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Relax, surrender, trust in him. You matter more to him than everything else he's made. He thinks you're worth it. 
And that, my friends, is what it means to be creative.